In the human body, tissues are groups of cells and extracellular products that work together to serve a common function. Now, the consistency of tissues in the human body ranges from fluid to quite solid, and the structure is strongly related to that tissue's function. So, for example, tissue that needs to provide support is more rigid. If it needs to provide protection from the external environment, it tends to be multiple cell layers thick, uh, while tissue that facilitates diffusion only has a few layers so that it can more easily facilitate transport of these molecules across. There are four principal classes of tissue in the human body, connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. These tissue types vary in the structure and function of their specialized cells, as well as the extracellular matrices that surround those cells. Now throughout this course, we're gonna to continue to examine each of these classes of tissue in depth, but today we're going to begin with connective tissue specifically. Connective tissue is the most diverse, abundant, and widely distributed tissue in the body. It's designed to support, protect, and bind structures together, as its name implies. And connective tissue has a huge degree of diversity. It includes bones and cartilage of the skeleton, fibrous tendons and ligaments, body fat, and even blood. Now, before we dive into too much detail of connective tissue, we're going to play a little bit of a game here. I have six different figures up on this screen that are micrographs of different types of connective tissue. I'd like you to just pretend that you are sitting there next to your partner and you are trying to get your partner to, to figure out which one of these you happen to be looking at. And so you're going to focus on one of these and I want you to think about how you would describe that image to another person. If you wanted them to figure out that you were wanting to identify figure number two, how would you describe that? So go ahead and pause this video for a sec and go ahead and write that down in your notes for a minute. Okay, so hopefully you've come up with a list of descriptions for these different images. Um, I can just go ahead and share what mine were specifically. So if I was gonna try and, let's just go ahead and start with number four here and describe that one to you. I might've described that one as looking like there are a whole bunch of parallel fibers or parallel lines that are running with each other. Um, number two, that kind of looks like bubbles to me. Um, how about number six? How is that one different from the rest? Well, that one really looks like little curly fibers as opposed to some of the other ones, much more so than the other ones. Uh, number one, that kind of looks like a thin mesh network of various fibers or lines. Number three, that looks like a little bit more of a thicker network. Um, I've also heard that one described before as uh, looking kind of like cherry blossoms, um, the trees and the flowers. And then last but not least, those ones, uh, that number five, I've originally described as being more bundles of fibers, though I frequently hear students describe this image as looking like a steak. Why am I having you do this? I don't want you to just sit there and memorize these different types of connective tissue and think about what the words are that describe their structure. I want you to think about what that visualizes. So when you are thinking about these, these uh, tissues, I want you to be picturing them in your head, but use your own words and then think about, well, why does it look that way and what does that imply about its function? We're gonna come back to this in a minute and come back to these photos and talk about what these actually are, but this is something I want you to be thinking about as we're continuing throughout our discussion of tissues. So as I mentioned, connective tissue is the most diverse and abundant type of tissue in the body. And all connective tissue has three basic components to it. Cells, protein fibers, and then the ground substance that surrounds these cells and fibers. It has several different functions. Um, one is physical protection. So for example, bones that you can see an image of here down in the lower right, protect vital organs, fat that you can see, adipose tissue right over here um, in the lower left, helps to protect and provide cushioning for different organs. There's support and structural framework, so bones provide a framework, but also things such as cartilage. A connective tissue, as I mentioned before, is also responsible for binding structures together. So think about ligaments that will bind bone to bone or tendons that bind bone to muscle. Storage, adipose tissue, fat stores um, energy and bones store calcium and phosphorus. A transport, a lot of people don't think about blood as being a tissue, but blood is actually a type of connective tissue. It carries respiratory gases such as um, oxygen, carries nutrients, hormones, waste, a variety of chemicals that your body needs. And also immune protection. Macrophages, which are a type of white blood cell, are scattered throughout various types of connective tissue, and they phagocytize foreign bodies. Connective tissue that's present after birth can be classified into three broad categories. There's connective tissue proper, supporting connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue.
all three of these types of connective tissue derive from what are referred to as mesenchymal cells. Those are specifically stem cells that develop into connective tissue. Each type of connective tissue contains specific types of cells in order to meet its function. Fluid connective tissue includes blood and lymph. So the cells that are present in blood include things such as erythrocytes or red blood cells, leukocytes, white blood cells, and also platelets. In addition to these formed elements, blood also contains dissolved proteins in a very watery ground substance. And so together, those dissolved proteins and this substance form an extracellular matrix that we call plasma. And lymph is then derived from the blood plasma, though it doesn't actually have any formed elements, so we don't have a histological image of it. Supporting connective tissue consists of cartilage and bone, and we're going to be talking more about those types of tissue later in this lecture. And then connective tissue proper is kind of the broadest category of connective tissue, and that can be subdivided into loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue, both of which we'll further subdivide here shortly. Let's start by considering now this connective tissue proper. So connective tissue proper contains two classes of cells in addition to several types of protein fibers. Some of those cells are considered to be resident cells, so those are cells that are essentially not moving around, that are pretty much staying in place, while other ones are considered to be wandering cells. This here is an image from your textbook that is designed to just depict connective tissue in general, but it very closely resembles a couple types of connective tissue proper, so that's why I'm going to use this one to label in respect to this type of connective tissue. So what are some of the types of resident cells that we'll find in connective tissue proper? One of them, and one of the most common, is fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are tapered cells. Uh, they're most abundant in this connective tissue proper relative to other types of connective tissue. And these are the cells that are responsible for producing the protein fibers and also producing the ground substance that surrounds these cells. There are also mesenchymal cells. And as we already mentioned, mesenchymal cells are an example of stem cells. So these are stem cells for this connective tissue that can then replace any of the damaged tissue. Adipocytes are fat cells. And then we can also see in this image an example of a macrophage. These are able to phagocyze either damaged cells or pathogens that you're going to find in the tissue. Some macrophages are also wandering cells. So how about protein fibers? Protein fibers are primarily responsible for strengthening and supporting the connective tissue. And the type and abundance of these fibers varies depending on what that function is. Collagen fibers are parallel fibers. They're very strong, but also flexible and resistant to stretching. Collagen is actually the most abundant protein in your body, and it has kind of a whitish appearance to it. So this is the um, you're going to find a lot of collagen in structures such as tendons and ligaments, and that's what gives them this whitish color. There are also elastic fibers. This, these fibers are made out of a protein called elastin. It's thinner than collagen, and it's also able to stretch and recoil. So if you think about the concept of elasticity, think about a piece of elastic fabric. You can stretch it out and lengthen it, but then what happens when you let go? It returns to its um, original shape. And so that's what happens with these fibers. So these are what allow tissues to move and expand in some way and then return to their original state when that pressure is eliminated. So things such as your lungs or arteries that need to stretch tend to have a lot of elastic fibers. They appear a little bit more yellowish and they can also occur in a branching or wavy type of pattern. And then there is also reticular fibers. Reticular fibers contain collagen, but they are in a branching, kind of interwoven or mesh-like arrangement. They're really tough, but also flexible. And so these tend to support organs that help and help prevent any kind of physical damage of cells and blood vessels. Now, unlike some other types of tissue, such as epithelial tissue, the individual cells of connective tissue are not typically in contact with one another. They tend to be suspended in this extracellular matrix. Um, and this extracellular matrix is what contains not only these protein fibers, but these, uh, that extracellular matrix is going to contain these protein fibers and then whatever that ground substance is. Okay, so let's now apply this a little bit more specifically to our loose connective tissue and our dense connective tissue. Loose connective tissue essentially serves as the body's packing material, and you're going to find it in spaces surrounding organs. There are three types of loose connective tissue areolar connective tissue, adipose tissue, and reticular tissue. 
dense connective tissue is much stronger and it tends to have its fibers much more closely packed together. The majority of the fibers in dense connective tissue are going to be collagen, which helps to give it that strength as well. And there are three types of dense connective tissue, regular, irregular, and elastic. So the three types of loose connective tissue. Let's first talk about areolar connective tissue. Areolar connective tissue is highly variable in appearance. Uh, it contains fibroblasts, which you can see some examples here of the dark little cells there and also some other types of cells that, the, that you're going to find in the connective tissue. Very loosely arranged collagen fibers, they're not bundled up tightly, and also these elastic fibers which allow the tissue to return back to its original, state shape, uh, original shape after it's been distorted. You're also going to find blood vessels in the areolar connective tissue, and it has a very viscous ground substance, and so that allows it um, to absorb shock. It's very widely distributed throughout the body. You're going to find it in places such as the subcutaneous layer of the skin. It's going to surround nerves, blood vessels, muscle cells, and a lot of other places as well. Adipose tissue, as we mentioned before, is fat. This contains adipocytes, which you can see examples of right here. And these are going to be filled with fat droplets. And because of that, the nucleus, which is those dark little spots, are actually pushed to the side. So because the majority of that cell, the majority of the volume of that cell consists of fat. This provides padding around organs, cushions and shocks, cushion shocks, um, and helps to also insulate the skin from heat loss. Fat tissue is also uh, capable of storing energy when it is broken down in metabolic processes. And then reticular connective tissue. This tissue contains a combination of reticular fibers, fibroblasts, leukocytes, and it uh, forms this, uh, a structural support for organs such as your lymph nodes, spleen, thymus, and it's also found in your bone marrow. So how about dense connective tissue? Uh, we have dense regular connective tissue and dense irregular connective tissue. The dense regular connective tissue has wavy parallel collagen fibers, and you're gonna find this in structures such as tendons and ligaments, where the force tends to be applied in one direction very few blood vessels here, and that also contributes to the fact that it takes longer for these structures to heal after some type of injury because you don't have a constant supply of nutrients and other necessary chemicals to help that tissue repair itself. Dense irregular connective tissue, on the other hand, also contains collagen fibers, but these are organized in a mesh-like network in various bundles. So because of this, because they're not all parallel, dense irregular connective tissue is able to resist stress that occurs in various directions. So you're gonna find dense irregular connective tissue in locations such as the dermis of the skin, the perichondrium of cartilage, periosteum of bones, a, a fibrous capsule around the liver, kidneys, and spleen. And then there's also elastic connective tissue. This is a connective tissue that contains, um, as you could probably guess, more elastic fibers, and the specifically branching elastic fibers, in addition to having densely packed collagen fibers. This is the tissue that, when stretched in some way, it's going to return to its original shape after that distortion. So you're gonna find elastic cartilage in, um, for example, your vocal cords, walls of the large arteries that, deal, that have to expand um, when the heart is pumping, uh, and then also the trachea. So now let's return to our game. Here are the original six pictures along with the terms that I used to describe them. So let's start with number one here. This was a thin mesh network. Which type of connective tissue does this represent? Areolar connective tissue. So now ask yourself, why would areolar connective tissue represent a thin network of fibers? Areolar connective tissue is a loosely organized network of various types of protein fibers as well as some of the cells that we're going to find there. What about number two? That's adipose tissue. We can see the large fat droplets along with the little nuclei that are going to be right around the edge of those cells. Our thick mesh network is going to be our reticular tissue. So one, two, and three are all representing types of loose connective tissue. Four, five, and six are going to be our examples of dense connective tissue. Number four, with all the parallel fibers, that is our dense regular connective tissue. So all of those fibers are running parallel to each other, so they're able to resist force in a single direction. 
Number five, these bundles of fibers. That's dense irregular connective tissue because those bundles are arranged in a variety of different orientations. And then our curly fibers that kind of represent our little springs there are the elastic fibers. So those are the six types of connective tissue proper. Let's return now to our organizational table that we have here. We've covered the six different types of connective tissue proper after dividing them into the subgroups of loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. And now we're going to move on to the supporting connective tissue. Broadly, supporting connective tissue is considered to be either cartilage or bone, but those have subdivisions as well. Uh, cartilage comes in three different forms, hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. And there are two different types of bone tissue, compact bone and spongy bone. We are going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about the structure and function of cartilage and bone, beginning with cartilage. Cartilage is a semi-rigid connective tissue that's weaker than bone, but more flexible and resilient than bone, and it's found throughout the body. Uh, as with all types of connective tissue, cartilage has a population of cells that are embedded within a gel-like extracellular matrix made up of proteins and a ground substance. Cartilage has three major functions in the body, the first of which is support, and we can see several examples in that, whether they are the cartilaginous rings that help support the trachea so it doesn't collapse, it's bringing air to your lungs, or your external ear, um, or even the fibrocartilage pads that are in between the vertebrae in your vertebral column. Cartilage also helps to provide a gliding surface at articulations where two bones meet. And then finally, it provides a model for the formation of most bones in the body. We're going to see examples of that in a little bit when we talk about how bones grow. Mature cartilage cells are referred to as chondrocytes. Chondro is a prefix that refers to cartilage, so we're going to see that come up a lot in this course. And chondrocytes occupy what are known as lacunae, these small spaces within the matrix. Now, chondrocytes produce a chemical that actually prevents blood vessels from forming, um, and that's why mature cartilage is avascular, so it has no blood vessels in it. Um, because of this, chondrocytes have to exchange nutrients with the blood vessels outside of the cartilage by diffusion alone. Usually, cartilage has a covering that's called the perichondrium, peri meaning around, chondro, remember, refers to cartilage. This layer that is made out of dense irregular connective tissue provides both protection and mechanical support and can also help to secure the cartilage to other structures. There are three main types of cartilage, each depicted here in one of these images. The first is hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is the most common type of cartilage in the body, but it is also the weakest type. It contains collagen fibers, which are not easily seen on this slide, as well as chondrocytes and lacunae, and it does have a perichondrium. Hyaline cartilage supports soft tissues. So for example, in the, the nose, the trachea, or larynx, it forms most of the fetal skeleton. It can be found in the growth plates of bones, the articular ends of long bones, and the costal cartilage, which is the cartilage that can be found adjacent to the ribs in the thoracic cage. Fibrocartilage is the second type of cartilage. Fibrocartilage consists of fibers that are in bundles and large chondrocytes in lacunae, but it does not have a perichondrium. Fibrocartilage is more durable than hyaline cartilage, and it's primarily used in areas or found in areas where shock absorption and compression resistance is needed. So for example, the discs that are in between the vertebrae, the pubic symphysis, uh, at articulation and uh, menisci of the knee joints as well. And last is elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage has elastic fibers that form a mesh-like arrangement around the chondrocytes and the lacunae. It's flexible, it's resilient, it does have a perichondrium, and elastic cartilage is going to be found in structures that return to their original shape after they've been distorted in some way. So for example, your external ear or your epiglottis. This image is showing where these three types of cartilage can be found in various parts of the body. So again, our hyaline cartilage, we can see it in the costal cartilages of the ribs and at those articular ends of these long bones. We can see, um, as well as in the cartilages of the nose there, uh, fibrocartilage, the one that's in red, we can see that in those intervertebral discs, an area such as the pubic symphysis, and um, a meniscus in the knee. 
And then the elastic cartilage we can see in the ear as well as in the epiglottis. Cartilage was our first type of supporting connective tissue. So now let's move on to talk about bone tissue. Bones occur in a variety of shapes and sizes that reflect each of their functions. And there are four classes of bone. Long bones are bones that have a greater length than width. Most of the bones in your body are going to be long bones. So some examples are your femur, the humerus of your upper arm, the radius and ulna of your lower arm, um, even all of the bones that, are, that make up the digits in your hand or in your feet. All of those are examples of long bones. Short bones are bones that have nearly equal length and width. A lot of the bones that are part of your wrist or your ankle are going to be examples of these types of short bones. Flat bones, as their name implies, have flat, thin surfaces. So the bo um, several of the bones in your skull, your ribs, your sternum, or your scapula are examples of flat bones. And then irregular bones. These tend to have elaborate, complex shapes. Uh, your vertebrae, uh, several of the other facial bones are all examples of irregular bones. One thing that I do want to point out here is that the terms short and long when describing bones are not relative to each other. We have to take into consideration that it's the length relative to the width that classifies something as a long or a short bone. So for example, you may think about the bones that are in your fingers as being very short, especially relative to something like your femur. But even the little bones that are in your fingers are classified as long bones just as the femur is because they have a length that's greater than the width. Long bones, as I mentioned, are the most common bone shape in the body, and so these are going to serve as a useful model for bone structure. This image that you can see right here is an example of a femur, and I've divided it up here into the three primary regions along the length of the bone. So the diaphysis is the elongated shaft of the bone, and that, consists, um, that comprises the majority of the bone. And then at both the proximal end and the distal end, you're going to have your, the epiphysis. The epiphysis is a knobbier and large region at each end that helps to strengthen the joint and serve as an attachment point for tendons and ligaments. And then in between the diaphysis and the epiphysis is where you're going to have the metaphysis. This is the region that contains the growth plate of the bone, what is called the epiphyseal plate. This is where the uh, elongation of the bone is going to occur during development. Let's zoom in a bit so we can see some of the additional structures. The articular cartilage is a thin layer of hyaline cartilage that is going to cover the epiphysis, usually at both the proximal and the distal ends. This helps to reduce friction and absorb shock in joints that are movable. The periosteum is a layer of dense irregular connective tissue that covers the external surfaces of bones, except where the articular cartilage is going to be found. This layer is anchored to the bone below by perforating fibers that are embedded within the bone matrix. The periosteum acts as an anchor for blood vessels and for nerves. The endosteum covers the most internal surface of the bones, and you're going to be able to find most of the types of bone cells in this region. And then last here, you can see what we call the medullary cavity. This is the hollow cylindrical space in the diaphysis. In adults, it contains yellow bone marrow, which is a fatty tissue that's formed as red bone marrow degenerates. This image here gives us another view of these two different layers. The periosteum, as you can see, contains not only those perforating fibers, but just superficial to that is a cellular layer followed by a fibrous layer. And recall again that those perforating fibers are then helping to anchor that periosteum to the bone matrix itself. We're going to talk about those detailed components of the bone matrix a little bit later, so don't stress about that now. On that internal surface of the bone is where we're going to have the endosteum. And you can see this entire layer right here that's kind of in this darker pink is representing the endosteum. And the endosteum is going to contain several different types of cells. Three of them are represented here, an osteoprogenitor cell, osteoblast, and an osteoclast. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about these different bone cell types. So osteoprogenitor cells, which you can see is represented in that image by this shape, are essentially uh, stem cells that will ultimately develop into bone cells. 
As osteoprogenitor cells develop, they initially will become what are called osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are responsible for secreting osteoid, which is mostly collagen and a type of organic glue that hasn't yet been mineralized. Osteoid is going to help create the bone matrix, which consists of about 90 to 95% collagen, and it's quite flexible. Some osteoblasts are going to remain on top of the new bone and protect it, while other osteoblasts are going to become trapped and surrounded by the bone matrix that they produce. If those osteoblasts become trapped, they essentially become inactive, as you can see represented here in this figure, and are called then at that point osteocytes. Osteocytes are relatively inert. They're the most common type of cell that you're going to find in the bone, and they help to maintain the bone matrix and reside in lacunae, small spaces that are found within the bone's matrix. Osteocytes help to facilitate signaling and communication with the bone. They help to regulate things such as bone mass and phosphate metabolism. And the last cell you can see here is an osteoclast, and I've got a little zoomed in version of this as well. Osteoclasts are very large, especially relative to these other bone cell types. They're multinucleate, so they have multiple nuclei, and they're very similar to macrophages. These are cells that kind of wander around and resorb bone, and as they resorb this bone, they then release that calcium and phosphate so it can be used in other parts of the body. I'd like to take a minute to show you a short video that I think gives you a really good represent, uh, representation of these different types of bone cells, better than I could even explain it to you. Bone is a dynamic tissue that is continually being built, broken down, and rebuilt in a process called bone remodeling. Bone tissue is broken down and resorbed by multinucleated cells known as osteoclasts. These cells are derived from monocytes which originate within bone marrow. Osteoclasts play an important role in liberating minerals and other molecules stored within the bone matrix. Bone tissue serves as a repository for vital minerals including calcium phosphate and various biologically active molecules, such as growth factors. The release of calcium from the bone can play a role in maintaining its homeostasis within the body. The cells responsible for building new bone tissue are known as osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are thought to be derived from cells found to be associated with blood vessels. Once active, they start to produce the organic component of bone, osteoid, which is predominantly made of collagen. Minerals start to crystallize around the collagen scaffold to form hydroxyapatite, the major inorganic constituent of bone, which contains calcium phosphate. Bone mineral density, or BMD, can be used to estimate the strength of bone and to assess the risk of fracture. As osteoblasts form new bone tissue, many become embedded within the matrix and differentiate into osteocytes. The structure, composition, and cellular processes that occur within bone allow it to simultaneously serve as a calcium reservoir, while providing structural support for the vital organs and for locomotion. Most bones contain two types of bone connective tissue, compact bone and spongy bone. Compact and spongy bone have the same matrix composition, but they differ in the three-dimensional arrangement of the osteocytes, the canaliculi, and the lamellae. Compact bone is solid and fairly dense, while spongy bone has a more open network and does literally appear like a sponge. In a long bone, compact bone forms the walls of the bone, which you can see here just underneath the periosteum, while an internal layer of spongy bone surrounds the medullary cavity. Spongy bone is also going to be found up in the epiphysis, where there is no medullary cavity.
Now in a flat bone, such as you see here on the left in the bone of the skull, the spongy bone is actually sandwiched in between two layers of compact bone. And this layer is referred to as a diploe. So you can see in this flat bone, in contrast to the long bone, there is no medullary cavity in the middle of that spongy bone. Let's look at the diaphysis of a long bone in more detail. On the surface of the bone, we have our periosteum that is anchored to a layer of compact bone underneath. Internal to the compact bone is the spongy bone. The functional unit of a mature compact bone is the cylindrical osteon or haversion system. These cylindrical structures run parallel to the diaphysis. In an osteon, the osteocytes are arranged in circular layers that you can see here all around a central canal or haversion canal. This contains nerves and blood vessels that supply the osteon. Other passageways that are known as perforating canals extend perpendicular to the surface, and blood vessels in these perforating canals deliver blood to osteons deeper in the bone and then also surface the medullary cavity. Osteons contain rings of bone around the central canal called concentric lamellae. These lamellae form a series of concentric rings that resemble a bullseye target around that central canal. Collagen fibers, which are depicted here by these angular lines, also spiral along the length of each lamella, and the difference in direction of spiraling within adjacent lamellae help to strengthen that osteon. Osteocytes, as you can see here, are housed in lacunae between concentric lamellae. Extensions of these osteocytes travel through canaliculi, which are tiny interconnecting channels within the bone that extend between lacunae. These canaliculi allow the osteocytes to connect and communicate, and they also enable the passage of nutrients and waste to and from the blood vessels within the central canal. Here are two micrographs of the compact bone, both from a elect uh, scanning electron microscope and then just a regular light microscope. You can see here up on the top where this central canal is that has the blood vessels, and then you have all of these concentric lamellae that are surrounding that canal. The little gaps that you see there are the lacunae where the uh, osteocytes would be located in living bone. Here's a, the light micrograph of this, and you can again see that con, uh, central canal with the concentric lamellae surrounding it, and the dark spots there are the lacunae. The major difference between compact and spongy bone is the arrangement of spongy bone into a lattice-like branching network that we call trabeculae. Numerous interconnecting spaces occur between the trabeculae. This open framework results in a much lighter bone than compact bone, though spongy bone has considerable strength despite its relatively light weight. Thus, the presence of spongy bone reduces the weight of the skeleton and makes it easier for muscles to move the bone. Spongy bone is found wherever bones are not stressed heavily or where the stress arrives from many different directions. In spongy bone, osteocytes are housed in lacunae, but they are between what are called parallel lamellae, as opposed to the concentric lamellae that you're going to find in the compact bone. I do want to point out that in this figure of your textbook, there is an error. Um, in this part of the figure, they label it as an interstitial lamellae. The interstitial lamellae, um, which is a term I'm not holding you responsible for, are actually these little bits of um, a lamellae that are kind of incomplete, kind of cut off in between the various osteons of the compact bone. The lamellae in the spongy bone are parallel lamellae. Ossification refers to the formation and development of bone connective tissue. It begins in the embryo and continues as the skeleton grows during childhood and adolescence. The process of bone development and growth is carefully regulated, and a breakdown in regulation affects all body systems. From fertilization until about eight weeks of age, an embryo skeleton is composed primarily of hyaline cartilage. At this point, the bony skeleton begins to form. During subsequent development, the bones are going to increase tremendously in size. The process of ossification differs between flat bones and other bones of the body, but we're going to focus on the growth of a long bone as our ossification model. The diameter of a long bone enlarges through growth at the outer surfaces of the bone in a process called appositional growth. In this process, stem cells in the inner layer of the periosteum differentiate into osteoblasts and add bone matrix to the surface. Over time, these deeper layers are then recycled and the medullary cavity enlarges. Bones also grow in length through a process called interstitial growth. Endochondral ossification begins with the formation of a hyaline cartilage model, and subsequently this cartilage will then be replaced by bone. Endochondral means within the cartilage, and this growth is quite literally occurring inside the original cartilage model. I don't want you to stress about the details of this process, but I do want you to understand the basic principles. 
In the center of the hyaline cartilage model, chondrocytes are going to start to resorb and eat away at some of the surrounding cartilage, producing holes in the matrix. The cartilage then begins to calcify and the chondrocytes begin to die. In the center of this shaft, stem cells are going to divide to form osteoblasts, which begin secreting osteoid around the calcified cartilage. This region is called the primary ossification center. The same process that forms the primary ossification center occurs later in the epiphyses, producing secondary ossification centers. Osteoclasts also resorb some bone matrix within the diaphysis, starting the formation of the hollow medullary cavity. As development continues, bone replaces all of the hyaline cartilage except for the articular cartilage at the ends of the epiphysis and the epiphyseal growth plates. This growth process continues through puberty until ossification of the epiphyseal plates, indicating that the bone has reached its adult length. We reach our peak bone density in our 20s and it continues to decrease then as we age. As we age, our bone changes in two major ways. First, it's going to lose the ability to produce organic matrix, mainly collagen, because osteoblast activity declines while osteoclasts maintain their normal activity. Essentially, bone is being resorbed faster than it can be replaced. Second, it loses calcium and other bone salts, and as a result, the bones become thinner and weaker. There's less collagen present and thus fewer sites to actually deposit calcium and phosphate. Parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, both secreted from the thyroid gland, are two hormones that regulate levels of calcium in the blood. Parathyroid hormone stimulates osteoclasts to resorb bone, thereby increasing calcium levels in the bone, while calcitonin inhibits osteoclast activity that resorbs the bone, thus promoting calcium deposition from the blood into the bone. Calcitonin secretion decreases with age, while parathyroid hormone concentrations increase with age, and as a result, calcium deposition decreases and release increases. And this can result ultimately in osteoporosis, or a decrease in bone density, accompanied by microstructural changes that compromise normal function and increase the risk of fracture. Osteoporosis can occur as early as 35 to 40 years, and more so in women than men. In fact, one in four women over the age of 60 will have developed osteoporosis. Sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, increase the rate of bone formation by osteoblasts, so as the production of these hormones decreases with age, the rate of bone formation will decrease as well. Now, the distinction between normal decrease in calcification that accompanies aging and the clinical condition of osteoporosis is simply a matter of degree. I'd like to take a few minutes now to show you another short video that summarizes the basics of this growth process, as well as explaining how bone mass decreases as we age. Bone is living tissue. Bone building is far from complete when a baby is born. During growth, from infancy to adulthood, bone is increased in size, strength, and hardness. Also, in different parts of the body, bones grow at different rates. Bone growth is partly in response to stresses that are put on the bone by weight-bearing motion. The simple acts of walking, running, jumping, and lifting heavy objects put strain on bones that results in increased bone density. Trabecular bone is found in the shaft and at the ends of the long bones, inside the spinal vertebrae, and inside the flat bones of the pelvis. In the ends, trabecular bone completely fills the cavity, and its structure transmits stress forces to the shaft. Trabecular bone forms an internal scaffolding network for bone. The trusses and arches found within the trabecular bone provide for the great strength of bone and yet surprising lightness. The arches and trusses inside trabecular bone provide a sponge-like appearance in the bone and also create the opportunity for blood vessels to penetrate the bone structure from the center core, marrow, of the long bone. Bone remodeling is such a thorough process that one's entire bone structure is replaced approximately every 10 years. Once maturity is reached, about age 30, the process of remodeling slows and the loss of bone calcium deposits exceeds the replacement of the bone structure. Beyond this point, it is no longer possible to substantially increase bone density. Over time, the density of the arches and trusses diminishes and the spaces between them become larger.
This process leads to a general weakening of the bone structure. It is a very gradual process and requires decades before any noticeable bone weakness appears. Osteoporosis is the end result of the erosion of the arches and trusses. Osteoporotic bone has much larger spaces between the arches and trusses and is significantly weaker than normal bone. Therefore, it is more prone to fracture. This condition is responsible for many injuries related to falls in elderly people. Women are more susceptible to osteoporosis than men. This is probably related to hormonal influence on bone growth and calcification. Despite its strength, bone may crack or even break if it's subjected to extreme loads, sudden impacts, or stresses from unusual directions, and the damage produced is referred to as a fracture. Even a severe fracture can heal, provided that the blood supply and cellular components of the endosteum and the periosteum survive. Fractures are named according to their external appearance, their location, and the nature of the crack or break in the bone. Closed or simple fractures are completely internal and can only be seen on x-rays because they don't involve a break in the skin, but open or compound fractures project through the skin. These fractures are obvious upon inspection but are more dangerous than closed fractures due to the possibility of infection or uncontrolled bleeding. Many fractures also fall into more than one category because the terms overlap. So how exactly is a fractured bone able to repair itself? Immediately after the fracture, extensive bleeding occurs due to the tearing of blood vessels inside the bone and the periosteum. Over a period of several hours, a large blood clot or fracture hematoma is going to develop. Next, blood vessels invade the fracture hematoma at the periosteum and the endosteum. Fibroblasts are drawn in and produce collagen fibers that connect the broken ends of the bone. Chondroblasts also come in and produce a dense regular connective tissue that's similar to cartilage. This creates a fibrocartilaginous callus, or soft callus, and this process takes about three weeks. Next, osteoblasts are going to enter the fibrocartilaginous callus and produce trabeculae of primary bone. This creates a hard callus. The trabeculae of the hard callus will then thicken over several months. The hard callus will remain for about three to four months. Osteoclasts will eventually remove the excess bone from the endosteum and the periosteum, and compact bone will replace the primary bone that was originally deposited by the osteoblasts. Slight thickening may remain where the fracture healed, though over time this region will be remodeled and little evidence of the fracture will remain. This series of x-rays illustrates this process in an adolescent who had an oblique fracture of the femur. This first picture that you see here on the left was taken just after the cast was put on, shortly after the break itself. After about five weeks, you can see the hard callus that's formed around the bone. And then by the time we get to 10 weeks, um, about five weeks after that cast was taken off, you can see how the bone has resumed a fairly normal shape, though it does have a few denser areas of tissue there in the center, right where, around where that region of the break was. The process of fracture repair can become more complicated when it's occurring in a growing bone, especially if the fracture occurs near one of the epiphyseal growth plates. As part of an example, I would like to introduce you to Ian. Several years ago when Ian, Captain America here, was about four years old, he decided to jump around on the furniture in the living room like all children want to do at some point in their lives. He wasn't very far off the ground. He was standing on the ottoman, jumped off the ottoman, again, from just a few feet off the ground, and ended up in the hospital because he broke his femur. This resulted in him being in a cast for almost three months. He ends up in this very large cast that surrounds not only his abdominal region, but his right thigh and his entire left leg. So why was a cast this extreme necessary in a case such as this? Hopefully you recall that both the proximal and distal ends of a long bone contain epiphyseal growth plates. These regions contain hyaline cartilage and are the locations of appositional growth. Ian's fracture was very close to his femur's proximal growth plate, just distal to the femur's head. In adolescence, growth plates are very easy to spot on an x-ray because this cartilage contains less mineral content, making them appear darker on an absolute gray image than the rest of the bone. In this image here, you can easily see the growth plate of the radius, just proximal to the wrist. The epiphyseal plate is composed of four zones of cells and activity. The reserve zone is the region closest to the epiphyseal end of the plate. 
This contains small chondrocytes within the matrix. These chondrocytes don't participate in any bone growth, but instead they secure the epiphyseal plate to the osseous tissue of the epiphysis. The proliferative zone is the next layer towards the diaphysis. And this contains slightly larger chondrocytes and continually makes new chondrocytes via mitosis. Next is the zone of maturation and hypertrophy, where you'll find chondrocytes that are older and larger than the ones in the proliferative zone. The more mature cells are situated closer to the diaphyseal end of the plate, and it's in this zone that chemicals such as lipids and glycogen cause the cartilaginous matrix to calcify and harden. The oppositional growth of the bone is a result of the cellular division in the proliferative zone along with the maturation of cells in this zone. Next is the, and finally, is the zone of the calcified matrix, and this is the zone that's going to be closest to the diaphysis. This contains chondrocytes that are essentially dead because the matrix around them has completely calcified. Capillaries and osteoblasts from the diaphysis will start to penetrate into this zone, and the osteoblasts secrete bone tissue on the remaining calcified cartilage, and thus the zone of calcified matrix connects the epiphyseal plate to the diaphysis. A bone grows in length when this bone tissue is added to the diaphysis. It's these two regions right here, the reserve zone and the proliferative zone, where this process is starting, that are the most susceptible to damage. When these regions are damaged, it can disrupt that area of the epiphyseal plate and stunt or disrupt bone growth in that region. The Salter-Harris classification system was proposed in 1863 and, at, and remains the most widely used system for describing growth plate fractures. A type 1 growth plate fracture includes a transverse fracture that passes all the way through the growth plate, and it doesn't actually involve the bone. A type 2 fracture is above the growth plate, so the transverse fracture goes partway, partway through the growth plate and then up through the metaphysis. Both type 1 and type 2 fractures have a fairly good prognosis if they are stabilized and allowed to heal without any kind of movement or disruption. In a type 3 fracture, the transverse pro uh, fracture passes through the growth plate but then down through the epiphysis to the articular surface of the bone. Type 4 is going to be similar but the fracture passes directly through the metaphysis, through the growth plate, and through the epiphysis. Both of these fractures, type 3 and type 4, um, have a much poorer prognosis because the proliferative and the reserve zones are the ones that are being impacted. And this can result in what's known as a physial bar formation or a bony bar formation. We're essentially removing the cartilage from that region because when the, when the bone fracture repair process occurs, um, this area is going to be ossified. And so we're disrupting this plate. So we're going to still be able to have growth occurring in this region of the bone and in this region of the bone, but not in the middle or potentially normal growth on one region, but then the other side as a whole is going to be disrupted. Ultimately, this can result in uneven growth across the plate. Here's one example of how this could occur if we're looking at a fracture, in this case of the proximal tibia. So you've got a fracture going through that growth plate. And so then as that heals, we're going to have this gap in the growth place. Because of that, you're going to have this uneven growth. So on one side where we did not have that disruption, it's going to have normal rate of growth while you're going to have stunted growth on the other side. And what's the ultimate result is that you have a bone that is growing unevenly or asymmetrically. Here's another example of seeing that happen in the proximal end, this is the tibia and this is the fibula right at the ankle here. You can see this growth plate and you can see how it's actually, after uh, this is post-fracture, how the growth plate is even taking a little bit of an oblique angle here. And last is a type 5 fracture. Uh, type 5 is very uncommon, but this is more of a crushing type of injury that doesn't actually displace the growth, pl growth plate, but completely damages it by direct compression. And this obviously has the worst prognosis of any of these types of growth pl plate fractures because you've completely destroyed the growth plate. When something like this happens, it's going to stop the growth at that end.
So this is showing a, an example of a really severe case in which a person had a fracture of their distal femur and it completely crushed the growth plate. So you can see here how on this person's right leg, the femur is several inches shorter than the left side because the left femur kept growing because its growth plate was fine while on the right side that was stunted. So what about Ian? Fortunately, Ian's fracture did not pass through his growth plate, but it was very close. If he was older, he likely would have had the fracture stabilized with screws, as you can see here. Um, but this elaborate cast that he's in, which is called a spica cast, provides enough um, immobilization of the hip joint that the bone has time to heal uh, in the correct orientation. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, life can become very challenging with a toddler in this type of situation. Everything from changing a diaper to putting him in a car seat became a, a daily challenge. But fortunately, Ian's cast came off after about seven weeks and he uh, recovered fully with a fully functional leg, uh, though jumping on the living room furniture is now strictly prohibited.